Good morning. Please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. Please take your seats. Our program is about to begin. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Hope uh, you had a nice... Stand up for a second. Uh, hope everybody had a nice break. Um, I should have said this at the beginning. My bad. I apologize. Uh, as I mentioned at the top, this, we are, uh, we're a nonprofit health policy news organization. We've got a podcast called Trade-Offs. And we are recording today's uh, sessions for a podcast episode that we will drop probably in January or February. So if you're interested in hearing, if you love these conversations so much, you'll get a replay, a reprise of it sometime in the coming weeks. But I also do want to let people know, especially if you're asking questions, uh, that you may end up in the podcast episode. I, I, and I sincerely mean this. I'm sorry for not flagging that at the beginning. Uh, that said, we are about to have the second of three conversations. This one is going to feature ONC as the regulator and Oracle Health as the regulated. And I would like to have a warm round of applause for them on stage right now, please. Thank you so much. Uh, Mickey, uh, you don't really need to introduce yourself. That would almost seem silly. Um, but could you talk with us a little bit about as narrow as possible, and you did this a little bit at the, at the top this morning, but when it comes to racial bias and AI, what is, what is the purview of ONCs? Just as a quick introduction. Um, I'm Mickey Trabathi. I'm National Coordinator for Health. I'm Mickey Trabathi. I'm National Coordinator for Health IT. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I am neither as honest as Troy nor as smart as Suchi. So, um, but you know, we'll do we'll do our best up here. Um, More so, slippery than Troy. Okay. 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 <laughs> um, so we actually started looking at this in the summer of 2021 as we were you know thinking hard about health equity issues, and there was starting to get you know evidence of then it was, you know, we weren't sort of thinking artificial intelligence, which was the same thing, it was algorithmic bias. That's what we were starting to look at. And as we were thinking about health equity in the different dimensions, the secretary was, you know, was asking us, what are the, you know, the health equity issues related to health IT? Because um, as you know, it's a priority in the department, priority in the administration, and I'm sure he was doing this with all the operating divisions, staff divisions, but for us it was, you know, what are these issues in health IT? So we started looking deeper into it, and um, there were issues related to the data and a bunch of other things, but there was mounting evidence that, you know, Ziad Omermeyer, a number of other researchers were starting to uncover um, about the unintended consequences that, uh, of just, you know, sort of relatively naive applications of algorithms in, you know, in different places in, in the healthcare delivery system. So a couple that we had noticed that caught our attention and then started the process of, you know, educating ourselves and talking to the secretary about um, were, you know, one, there was, a, you know, a, um, a provider organization in California that had taken a... Um, an algorithm for what seemed to be a pretty benign thing, efficiency and scheduling. Um, and they applied this algorithm and what they started doing for efficiency and scheduling, because as you know, no-shows is a big deal in healthcare, right? It costs all of us a lot of money. Um, that's a very valuable, highly skilled set of people who are left standing without anything to do and none of us, you know, none of us really wants that. We want productivity. Um, and um, uh, what they did with the algorithm is they would determine, looking, you know, looking across patient population, who has a higher risk of being a no-show. And for those patients, we're going to double or triple, triple book the, um, the providers. And what ended up happening then, you can imagine, is someone shows up, and if they have transportation insecurity, for example, um, which a number of people do, um, they would have a higher likelihood of having a much longer waiting period if they showed up. And that, you know, you can imagine that applying in a wide variety of settings, um, in inner setting settings, in rural settings, um, you know, where people have to travel 50 miles with perhaps an old car that happened to break down twice in the last six months. Now they're bad luck. The, you know, the algorithm has picked them up as being 
at risk for not showing up and all of a sudden they're waiting three hours in the waiting room and perhaps they lose their job because as we know, a lot of people don't have the flexibility to say, I'm still at the doctor's office, I'll be in a little late, right? That just means, oh, don't show up tomorrow then, right? So that, we were looking at, you know, things like that. We were looking at... Um, and and, and yeah. let me jump in. Yeah, and, and, so, and so you... So you uh, we're going to introduce you in a quick second here, Dr. James Elsie. But um, uh, you see this kind of algorithm, and you're like, okay, th this is intended to try to solve a problem, a, a meaningful problem uh, that could actually end up helping a lot of people. But the unintended consequence ultimately is what? What's the like? What's the bottom line harm that could be happening? Yeah. Well, the it scared you guys. Sure. The unintended consequence was that um, communities of people who have less access to resources for a wide variety of reasons are being treated in a differential way that can really negatively affect them in ways that no one had really predicted. And to the you know to the credit of that provider organization in California, once it w once they were made aware of it, which I think was their own studies actually, um, they quickly shut it down and they tried to figure out different ways of doing it. Um, Dr. James Elsey, would you please introduce yourself real quick? Good morning, everyone. Um, so James Elsey, family physician, informaticist. I've done 26 years of federal service, and now I'm the chief medical officer in Oracle Health Government Services. I know somebody asked me earlier, is Oracle Health just a rebranding of Oracle Cerner? And I'll say no. So Oracle actually had a, uh, a life sciences section that has moved over to Oracle Health, as well as the EHR moving to Oracle Health. So it's a lot more than just the EHR. Great. Uh, so, Mickey. You're seeing, you're seeing these algorithms out in the wild. You're getting concerned that different people are going to be treated inequitably. Um, and so you have, I was just read this real quick. Uh, you have responded with a set of regulations, which as most people in this room know, were finalized on Wednesday. When it comes specifically to trying to reduce the amount of racial bias in AI, what is this regulation doing? And you've got, you've got a slide to sort of walk us through here, I think. Sure. Um, yeah, the focus of the regulation is on transparency and risk management. Um, and is there a slide up? It's up. Oh, okay. And I can't see it. So, um, okay. So there, there are, so there are nine categories. There it is. Um, when, you know, one of the things I would just point out first off is that these unintended consequences, you know, I mean, they're, could always be malicious, you know, uh, uh, sort of intent. But these are mostly about unintended consequences that, you know, that uh, that we just think that transparency helps people address those. And unless they're surfaced, um, you know, you don't have a good sense of, you know, of, of that there may even be an issue. Um, Peter Lee, the um, head of research at Microsoft, said that ChatGPT4 is the smartest, is like the smartest and the dumbest person you've ever met in your whole life. And right, and that's what we want to be able to say is, you know, how do you seize the promise of the smartest side and guard against the dumbest side. And that's what these algorithms do. Um, that's what these algorithms do, right? So that's, that's the idea here is to say, let's shine a light on these things. So what we've proposed is nine nine general categories of information that you can think of as a nutrition label, like a nutrition label. And, you know, we can talk about, you know, whether that analogy works or not, not works or not, but the idea is that, um, and this is, you know, something that the industry has been developing, this idea of model cards, I think, um, uh, you know, Google, I think, calls them system cards, or, you know, um, uh, Meta might call them system cards, I forget. But across the industry, this has been, you know, sort of, uh, you know, an emerging concept of saying, we ought to be able to have a way of providing some descriptive information about that algorithm so that the user of that algorithm um, is better informed about the appropriateness of the use in my particular setting. Um, and so we've proposed nine categories that are, I think there are 31 different um, requirements underneath this, which would be something that an EHR developer um, who is certified by ONC would be required to establish transparency for the user of the AI-enabled tools that are in the system. And to the extent that, um, and that transparency means that they have to create functionality to allow this data to be documented. And for algorithms, um, AI-enabled tools that they themselves supply, meaning that Oracle developed it nat natively as a part of their product, or Oracle um, is going to market with a partner who they've hired and made that a part of their product offering, they would actually be responsible for filling out 
as much of those 31 elements as they can and making that available to the customer. Um, for third party, um, you know, kind of uh, um, uh, kinds of algorithms that are enabled by the system, but that they themselves aren't responsible for. And in many cases, Oracle may not know. One of their customers actually did this on their own, right? That's the way this technology works. Um, the idea is that they wouldn't be responsible for going and getting that information from that third party, but the functionality has to be such that the customer, let's say the provider organization, the customer of Oracle, could fill that out, or the third party developer could fill it out. And what we, what we hope is that that will create an incentive for higher quality. Um, that, you know, for those who are familiar in economics with, you know, George Akerlof's famous study of the quality, the, the market for lemons. Was the idea was that when you have information asymmetries, in that case it was used cars, if the used car salesman knows everything about the quality of that car and you have no ability to know, you will quickly get a race to the bottom, that they're just selling at the same price high quality cars and low quality cars because you have no, have no idea. And that led to lemon laws and a whole bunch of other things. That's the idea here, is that if you shine light on this, the higher quality algorithms will start to rise to the top because provider organizations and others who are the users will say, well, wait a minute, this algorithm has all these fields filled out and I have a much better sense of, is it, was it performed? Is it stable? Are there known risks that I'm now aware of? And this algorithm is pretty spotty. They either <laughs> weren't able to give me good information or they actually left the fields blank. And you know, we're not saying that that should tell the provider use this or don't use this. We're not approving these in the way that FDA you know, approves uh, medical devices. What we're saying is that give that information to the provider organization and let them decide um, because at the end of the day, what the providers want to do is what they try to do every single day, which is has the best possible information to, um, to use um, uh, for and, and with their patients. James, you want to jump in here? I, I, this is one of those chances I want to say thank you, Mickey, because you heard us loud and clear. Um, we had a lot of concern, um, Oracle did, and I think some of the others in industry, about being held liable for third parties, putting things into our system, and then we couldn't get our certification still. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and, 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 and so I, I want to jump I want on, on this s slide that you just showed, Mikhail, I, I've basically, you're asking for something like this nutrition label uh, that you see on the back of a uh, jar of mayonnaise, and um, you've got these like 31 source attributes, right? And the categories that need to be included on, on that AI nutrition label, the fats, the sugars, calories, et cetera. Because in the same way that seeing how much sugars in a jar of Miracle Whip help, will help me decide what to eat. ONC is seeing uh, that the, these, these, these pieces of data are going to help end, these end users, health systems, clinicians, decide what algorithm they want to use or not. And I know one of the key ingredients that ONC thinks is super important in all of this is this idea of fairness, which we all sort of know as a word, but in this context is a little confusing. Can you walk us through what fairness means as it applies to this nutrition label? Sure. All right. The idea of fairness generally is um, anything that leads to conclusions based on, um, you know, sort of uh, inherited or acquired traits, which really have nothing to do with, you know, with what you're trying to um, accomplish at the end of the day. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's prejudice in some way, shape, or form um, in a sort of a more neutral sense, right? So we, um, I used to teach statistics in a previous life, and when we think about bias and statistics, you focus mostly on the mathematical sides of it. It's like sampling bias which is, in this case, would be unrepresentative populations. As you know, my good friend John Holamka likes to say, Mayo Clinic has fantastic algorithms developed on a million blonde Lutherans in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, and now I'm in San Juan, Puerto Rico, trying to figure out, is this, you know, is this algorithm? And in many cases, it may, it may not matter, right? There are no biological differences. The science suggests that it's okay. But the idea is that you ought to be aware that that's where that came from. The other um, type of bias you usually think about in statistics is omitted variable bias, which is that you've got some proxy variables in there that are really just proxies, but there's a whole bunch of other variables underneath that that you don't know about, and that's creating bias. So just throwing in a race category, for example, um, black, Hispanic, Asian, whatever it is, and what that ends up um, sort of um, uh, 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 you know, being a magnet for, almost a sink for, is all sorts of other biases that enter the picture that you don't normally take into account, like human bias, like systemic bias, bias if you think about you know, um, all of the things that will just get encompassed in a, single, um, on a single variable that says this person is of this color, 
and all of a sudden it's about the living conditions, it's about the, all the, you know, sort of the history of systemic bias, the, um, what's led to institutional differences that lead to all of that being collapsed into that single variable in ways that then can have, you know, sort of um, uh, differential outcomes that then lead to differences in the, in the way the treatment diagnosis happens. So those are the kinds of things that I think that we want to be able to look for and raise, you know, and, and, and sort of surface, right? There's no clear answer to those, I think, as we'll you know, talk about when we look at one of the slides. What we're trying to do is say, let's take a first step here. The industry needs to get a lot more consensus around the best ways of doing this. Folks like Suchi and others, the researchers, be able to grab onto this and say, let's develop some industry consensus conventions around this, but let's start. You have to start with transparency. You have to start with making, um, uh, you know, sort of available the information so that people can see that there are actually issues here. And Mickey, you're saying, you're saying a lot there and a lot of important things, but I, I just want to try to simplify it, at least so people in the audience can really hold this. When you talk about fairness, can you, to the best of your ability, define fairness in one sentence? Yes. Um, so does the, you know, is the, is the outcome being differentiated for people who actually have the same condition, like the same acuity, um, but, the out, but the model sees them as different. So one example would be, um, this is very well known, you know, um, Zayed Overmeyer did this work. Lots of commas in the sentence. Yep. Yeah, yeah. so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, of looking at, you know, so there's, a, you know, there's, there's one example, and, and, and hopefully it encapsulates what I was talking about, and I think we have, might have a slide about this later, is that um, there was an algorithm that was looking at um, being able to um, apply care management resources to patients who had higher complexity, right? I, I think all of us would agree. That's a good thing to do. Um, we ought to be doing that. So what did they do in the algorithm? They looked, they, they had a proxy variable, going back to this thing I said before about omitted variable bias, they had a proxy variable for high complexity, which was cost. And the idea was, well, higher cost patients are more complex, right? They must be. So let's apply care management resources to those higher cost patients. Well, what happened when they did more analysis is like, no, no, wait a minute. Complexity is only one part of higher cost. Another big factor in higher cost is actually whether you have good insurance. That's actually a big driver on whether you're higher cost because there are sources that are being there to be paid. And then when they actually looked at the underlying data, what they found was that more resources were being given to those who had better insurance because they were higher cost. But when they looked at the individuals, black versus white, the black versus white patients had the same acuity level. So they had the same issues from a medical perspective, and arguably they should have been getting the same care management resources, but what was happening was the care management resources were being directed to those who already were getting better care because they had better insurance. And so going back to this nutrition label, ONC is not, you're very, you're very clear, ONC is not endorsing one way to, that companies like James, should measure fairness or how it should even be displayed. Uh, that is not the role for ONC. Why could it be a problem? And I know you've got a slide here in a second. Why could it be a problem if different companies use different measures of fairness or display them in different ways? Who cares? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, we all should care because... Um, uh, we all you know, should care about, this and yeah. not to be quibbling with you, we should all care about what, standardization? Yeah, sorry, so we all should care about A, that we're capturing our categories, and then B, how is that represented? And, you know, so what we're starting with is saying, let's capture the categories, but leave it a little bit open right now because we don't have industry consensus on what's the best way of representing these, these things, which are very complicated. And there are arguably very reasonable vari variants in the way that um, you might measure certain things and the way you would present it, right? Just visualization. You could have the same, you know, kind of data, but you, you have different kind of visualization of it. And, you know, if you look at FDA food labeling, for example, they are pretty prescriptive, right? They say, no, it's got to be, you know, the, the biggest ingredient first, blah, 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 blah. If it's trans, you know, it has to be trans fat or trans. It has to have this, you know, sort of 
of um, uh, units of measure. Um, you've got to you know, be very specific and precise about that. Um, but that's based on a lot of industry understanding and scientific basis for doing this uh, to be able to represent that. And arguably, it's a little bit simpler. Um, in our industry, this is really complicated. We're just at the beginning of the beginning. So if you just look at these two representations for a, sec for a second, um, the top is from you know, sort of a, some general work on what are different ways of looking at a model card. Um, and it's kind of illustrative. So you can see there that there's a representation of breaking down age and gender and looking at an illustrative way of you know, what might be a false negative rate as it relates to those different, you know, those different subgroupings. And it's kind of a nice, nice depiction, right? It breaks it down by age and gender. You can see that um, as, the, you know, as the false negative rate you know, gets higher, you actually have greater dispersion as well. So you may have a bigger concern if you're looking at something for an old male because it's like, oh, wait a minute. You know, I've got higher mean and higher variance. So maybe, you know, maybe I'd be a little bit more cautious in the, in the use of this algorithm if that is the particular uh, you know, sort of patient in front of me. Versus the, you know, the slide on the bottom is that actually is a slide about the, um, the algorithm that I was describing before, about the one that was applying resources um, to, different, uh, uh, to black versus white patients um, at different levels based on their cost. What that shows is, um, is if you look at across all acuity levels, um, the patients, the black patients were actually getting um, less resources than the white patients. But if you look at another slide, which isn't on here, if you look at the graph that's a parallel graph of that, if you looked at their acuity levels, they actually were roughly the same. In many cases, the black patient was actually had higher acuity than the white patient, right? So if you looked at acuity, it was actually the same, but if you looked at the resources, based on cost, it shows that difference. So those are two different ways of visual, it's not the same exact data, but you can see that there are different ways of presenting that. And for right now, what we wanna say is, let's leave that a little bit open um, to see how the industry sort of responds to that. And then we as an industry work together on you know, sort of developing what are more standardized kinds of ways of doing that. And last point on this is, this is not atypical um, at all. So in, you know, in ONC certification, for example, we have sort of maturity of different kinds of requirements. So um, where we start with a functional approach to a certification, and then as the industry starts to you know, wrap their arms around, around a more standardized way of doing it, then we turn that into a specific technical standard. Now I would just point to API requirements, which we started with a functional definition of APIs, and now we've turned it into a specific FHIR implementation guide for the API, but it started, and then the second is electronic case reporting, which I talked about yesterday. Started off as a functional requirement for electronic case reporting, but in the rule we dropped yesterday, we have now a technical requirement for electronic case reporting because we've gotten better. So the idea would be the same kind of process here. Right, so ba basically just to sum this up in, in lay person's terms, like flexibility at the beginning, it's cutting edge, people don't really know what they are, people don't know what they know, they need that room, they need that space to be creative, to experiment because there could be some great amazing idea that's not try to like over-regulate initially, let's see what we can get and as we do that over time, we'll begin to refine this idea more and more. But we understand that we need the standardization because at the end of the day, if you have one label that says X, Y, Z and another that says one, two, three, it's like what the hell you do with that? Right, yeah, I mean, and I think two parts on that. One, if we tried to be that prescriptive right now, I can guarantee you 100%, this isn't an it depends, uh, uh, for sure. <laughs> this is a guarantee 100% from a federal official, we would be precisely wrong, right? I can guarantee that, we would be precisely wrong because we're you know, kind of overreaching in a space that there's still a lot of fluidity in. Um, and the second is, you know, that um, this stuff like this, in my experience, with data, with statistics, with visualizations, they only get better through use. They don't get better by someone sitting in a room, whether you're the smartest software engineer in the rural room or the smartest statistician or data scientist in the room. There's no perfect answer to that. The best way of doing it is getting it out, having people use it and bang away at that, and you start to get convergence around the things that work best. Fair enough. So uh, uh, James, let's bring you in here. Uh, so Oracle Health is one of the companies that will have to follow these new regs, uh, and you're gonna have to put together this nutrition label. You're welcome. <laughs> Can you walk us through how Oracle Health is thinking about w which fairness measures it thinks is most important? So we've been looking at fairness for a, a little bit, actually. Um, and where we looked at it is more on the AIML side than the healthcare side, I'll, I'll have to admit. But it's looking at the idea of, as we have these data sets and models that people are building inside of our cloud infrastructure, how do we give them the tools that are in, this, in that infrastructure to actually look at fairness? And we have something called Oracle Guardian AI, where it gives you um, 
fairness and looking more on the, the statistical side, so not trying to address um, unconscious bias, but really that statistical bias. Are your true negatives, are they the same across the different facets, whether it be gender, whether it be race, whether it be age? Um, those, are you getting that statistical prediction that you think you would, regardless of which group you're looking at. So trying to take that bias of the, those individual um, groups out of there and saying my true positives, my true negatives, my false positive, my false negatives. Just trying to make sure that the predictions are true no matter what variables you're introducing. Right, and, and, and uh, how do you think you will display this for end users, these clinicians, these uh, health system execs who are not experts in this, so it's easy and accessible and meaningful, right? Because that's the whole point. We're struggling with that. Um, we have many ideas, but we don't have anything concrete yet because, uh, you know, it's like when you talk about, I think it's box three that says where you shouldn't on, the, on the, his diagram. Oh, box okay. three is the diagram. <laughs> He's like, what diagram? Uh, uh, box three talked about, wow. you know, when you should not use um, an algorithm. Well, that can be a very lengthy conversation on why you shouldn't use it. Not just don't use it, but well, why shouldn't I use it? So how do you put that into something simple? Like it's tempting to give it a grade and a letter or a number just to say boom, or do you do narrative? And I was thinking it was very interesting because you're more the statistician and we are trying to figure out how to get the statistician PhD to translate something for the MD. And, and, and so great, and, and the fact that you're an MD, right? What, uh, what would you want? Something I can digest in seconds. <laughs> well, no, truly. <laughs> my, my fellow clinicians on the front. Well, I mean, if I have 20 minutes with a patient, I have the first five or 10 minutes is trying to get the patient who is new to me to trust me to actually tell me what's going on and to get that history. And then I do my physical exam and look at the, the, what's already been done for that patient. And now I have five minutes left to figure out what we should do going forward. So I don't have time to go and figure out and read a long narrative of, well, on this population, it was done in the Swedish in the 70s, and therefore, I don't have time for that. I need you to truth, truly tell me based on, you looked and saw what patient I have, and based on that, you give me a predictivity of 97% that this applies to your patient, and here's what you should do. I hear boom, yes. <laughs> yeah. I would agree with that. And one, one thing I would add on that, and that we tried to sort of recognize in the, in the rule is, you know, kind of two points on that. Well, one, one is, um, is not recognizing the rule, the first one, which is all of this, you know, this, this is one step forward to say you have to have transparency. But as we know, transparency is just one side of it. If people can't understand the information, there aren't yet enough suchis in the world for every provider organization to be able to say, oh yeah, all right, here's what I do with that information and here's how I determine how I'm gonna use that, which ones am I gonna use, you know, am I gonna you know, sort of constrain the use of them, you know, all of that. So we know that, 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 this, is the, that this is just the first step. Um, but you have to start with the first step, right? If we don't start with the transparency, you're not gonna get the education to, you know, to start going. The second thing is in our proposed rule, the draft rule, um, we had made a proposal that the information, this information be available to the end users, essentially like a drill down. From a lot of feedback we got on that was like, don't do that um, because that may not make sense and it could clutter the screen and it could confuse people. And so what we did is we sort of pulled that back once and we said it needs to be made available to the customer, to a limited set of users that the customer will determine. So Mayo Clinic can have its governance committee and make it available to that governance committee. They will figure out who are the limited users they want to make it available to. And then they will make decisions about what they're going to enable for the frontline users. And if they decide with, you know, with Oracle or Epic or whoever they're working with that we would actually like that to be made available to our end users, then great, that's up to them, but we're not making it a requirement. Thank you. Hey, James, I, I, I'm curious, you know, so ONC is looking for some sort of standardization. Based on the conversations you and others at Oracle are having, how how handicapped is for us? How close do you think the industry is to getting towards knowing, coalescing around an idea of like what fairness, specifically around fairness and displaying fairness? I think you, it, there's kind of two parts of the industry. There is more of the model development side of the industry, um, which I talked about from our life sciences, and then there's more the EHR side of the industry. And I think they look at it differently. I think when you look at it from an EHR standpoint, it's more looking at almost a patient safety lens. Um, are we causing harm to that individual patient versus looking to say, is this model valid across the entire population? 
So I think that that's kind of the two different ways we're looking at it as an industry. Um, I think Oracle is very well positioned because we cover both of those sides to really blend those together and help move the industry along. And I came in wanting to say one thing about having more standards up front, but Mickey, you've turned me with what your pre earlier comments, um, that you really did set us up for success to work to partner together to say, while we're not being prescriptive right now, we are probably going to be in the future and help us figure out what that looks like so that we can actually have standards in the way we display this information for the customers. Well, really, I, I thank you so much, for James, for, for introducing that. M Mickey, wh wh what, do you, what do you feel like you really need from the Oracles, the Epics, the other companies out there around this fairness, D just to keep it simple, sp only staying there, what do you need from the regulated entities to help you do pull this off and ensure that there is not racial bias, other kinds of bias being baked into the AI? What do you need from the regulated? Unwavering compliance. <laughs> um, <yes. laughs> that, was, that was a joke. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> oh, it wasn't a joke. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, no, I mean, I think, I think it's really, you know, working in partnership, um, you know, with industry, with the oracles, with the provider organizations, with the experts in the field um, to say, how do we converge on a set of industry con conventions that are going to work for us here? Yeah, I think that, you know, people who aren't, you know, sort of deeply involved in standards often have a misconception that standards come from the top down and then get enforced and everyone uses them. And... There are some that happen that way, and I would argue the vast majority of those are terrible and they don't work. The best standards are the ones that come more from the bottom up, that people have problems to solve, and they start getting together and say, I've got this problem to solve, and now we've developed different ways of you know, sort of standardizing, and then it starts to emerge that, okay, now we've just got four variants of something, and now we can take that you know, over the line. And that's where the federal government can come in and say, all right, we're gonna pick that up and say, all of you agreed uh, basically on four variants of the same thing. Let's now all agree on this one. Then at that point, most people are like, okay, fine, great. You know, I'm already there. So that's, you know, kind of what we want to be able to do here. We want to be able to work very actively with industry on that. And I would say, you know, one of the things you see in our, in our rule, and I think we're going to be doing more of, I'm sure, in this area, because it's more complicated than an API, for example, is we give a bunch of examples in our regulation of what would be something that would be considered a PDSI, you know, an AI-enabled tool that would call, fall under this. What are some things that wouldn't? Like a growth chart wouldn't, um, but, you know, another kind of algorithm would, for example, and I'm sure we're going to have many more examples that, you know, complex organizations like Oracle, um, like provider organizations that come up with, what about this, what about that? And we're going to, you know, try to learn together on, you know, how do we draw these lines. So, uh, j and you, I, I, th I, thanks for sketching out the conceptual. I just want you to, like, take this one step from conceptual to more practical. When I ask you, like, what is it you want from the regulated entities, you, you we talk about this coalescing, this standardization. Do you want uh, the regulated entities, do you want industry to go out and start having meetings? Like, what actually literally... What are the practical things that must happen in the real world in order for industry to coalesce? Yeah, I, mean, I think there are already industry collaborations that I think, you know, Troy had mentioned before, the Coalition for Health AI, there are a number of others, National Academy of Medicine is developing code of conduct and working, you know, very closely with that. And I think we've, uh, you know, as working with uh, the Coalition for Health AI, have suggested that we need more patient representation, um, for example, um, in, in those kinds of collaborations. But the idea is for those to, you know, we want to be able to participate in those, but to be able to get that kind of collaboration across the industry to develop more of these concepts, some of which you already see in the regulation as a part of, you know, things that have come out of those consensus type of processes. And James, what, what do you need from ONC here so you guys can do this thoughtful, complicated, sometimes seemingly impossible, fulfilling this impossible task? What do you think would help you help ONC? I think definitely the continued dialogue like we had for this rule, um, where you had it out there, you listened to us um, and at our concerns, um, but also the conversation we're having today where you said, well, this is where we know we need to go in the next couple of years and let's partner together and do that. What's, what, Mickey, are there any, I mean, it seems like you, you, you at ONC have prided yourselves on really trying to be accessible and available to the industry entities that you regulate, are there one or two different things you are going to do in and around the nutrition label that you have not done before to, to foster this environment that you're trying to foster? 
Um, I don't know if there's anything you know different in kind, but probably different in degree. Um, because this is a really complex space, I you know I see ourselves rolling up our sleeves perhaps more than you know than we have um, in the past with you know with certain different things. It obviously, obviously varies with what we're talking about. To work you know more in a more engaged manner with industry coalitions like Chai and others, um, because this is such fluid space, it's really important, and we need to you know help to be a part of and help to forward industry consensus. And in a way, if we can, you know, sort of be the ones who are kind of just nudging everyone that, hey, we can't, you know, be cycling around this stuff forever. We need to, you know, we need to move forward. Sometimes you can give industry an impetus that says, we are going to put something more specific into regulation a little bit down the road here, and that gives industry a little bit of a say, oh, we better figure it out, because otherwise they're gonna do it to us. And that's helped, you know, that, and that's helped, I think, in a partnership kind of way, because, you know, often, I mean, industry has a lot of priorities, it got a lot of competing priorities, so it helps give, you know, give them focus as well. I think we also, and we, you know, we do this, but I think, you know, we've been doing it a lot more in this area, um, is collaborating with our agency partners. So, you know, if you think about, you know, OCR, FDA, ONC, the three agencies that are all up here, um, uh, you know, FDA's regulations as it relates to medical devices, I like to think of this as, you know, we complement each other, all three. So FDA's is kind of, you know, sort of a foot wide because it applies to medical devices and those are that are commercially marketed. So if you fit into that bucket, now you're, you know, a medical device and it's really deep. Right, um, Suchi described in great detail how deep it is, um, but it's you know it's very very deep. It's now three months I think as a process, but um, uh, that was a joke. Um, but uh, but now, you know, and ONCs is actually like a foot deep and a mile wide because we are focused on transparency, but we cover a much broader expense, uh, expanse of these, kinds of, uh, of these kinds of tools. And you know, importantly, more and more of these AI-enabled tools are actually being developed by provider organizations. So even if they might qualify as a device, because they're not being commercially marketed, they don't actually don't have to go to FDA for that, even though they are being applied to millions of patients. I mean, think about a, you know, an integrated delivery network that's nationwide, it's being applied to millions of patients, and right now they wouldn't be under any of those. Now they're technically not under ours, but we're creating the opportunity for them to establish that kind of transparency for their users. And then as it relates to OCR and um, Section 1557, we think our regulation helps providers comply with the OCR um, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, regulations related to non-discrimination because by surfacing this information, it gives them greater ability to understand are there discriminatory things in this algorithm that I should be concerned about because I, you know, I can't be discriminating as, a, as per uh, OCR rules. And we're, we're about to go to questions, so if people have questions, please start going to the mics. But um, one final question here for you, Mickey. What is it about the nature of the challenge racial bias in AI that you think is bringing together the different agencies as you just outlined? Why, why are we seeing this sort of kind of collaboration, cooperation within the different agencies? Or, and, and perhaps that's an ignorant question on my part that this happens all the time, so I don't know, but is, is there anything unique about this watching OCR, ONC, uh, FDA. FDA, thank you, uh, work, work together? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, what we're all experiencing. I mean, I think we've just talked about how incredibly powerful, you know, this new set of technologies is already in our day-to-day -day lives. And we appreciate that that's true in healthcare as well. And that we need to be as assertive and, you know, sort of forward-leaning in this area as we possibly can. Um, so I think it's really just that recognition. Um, as well as, you know, there's, there's, I think, you know, I like to think in this administration, we've actually had a very collaborative process across the department where the deputy secretary is always reminding us that, you know, that the department needs to be greater than the sum of its parts. And so we, you know, see that at the leadership level, we see it at the working, at the working level for us to be working more closely together. And this is just one of those areas that a bunch of things have to come together to drive that consistency. And we're all thinking hard about it at the same time too, because often, you know, everyone's on their own timing, but in this particular case, everyone knows that, wait a minute, we've got to do something here executive order, all of that, you know, sort of driving us. So when you're doing that at the same time, it kind of forces you into a little bit of discussion of, wait a minute, are we defining algorithm in the same way as OCR is? Are we defining, you know, AI-enabled tool in the same way that FDA is? And let's make sure that we're all on the same page um, uh, with that so that we're not confusing ourselves as well as confusing the market. Very good, thank you. Um, I see no questions, anybody? Uh, would love to see some questions, if anybody has them in the, uh, as we wait for that. Um, please go to the mic if you do have questions. James, just turn to you for a quick second here. 
what's one thing that you want people in this room to know as they go, thinking about some of the challenges and opportunities that exist for companies, your company, but companies like yours in the industry here? Um, I think I want people to know that we, it's not something new that we have not been thinking about bias and fairness. We've been thinking about it for years. Um, we are happy that uh, ONC is now kind of pushing us as a industry to address it. Um, and we're looking forward to the time that we all are addressing it in a more standardized way. Thank you. And, and so much thank you. So many thank yous. Okay, great. We've got a couple, we've got a couple of questions. Fantastic. All right. Uh, yes, please. Hi, good morning. I just have a question about... And just introduce yourself, please. I'm Nick Van Dyne. I'm from Healthix in New York City. I have a question about where do you see AI handling the non-quantifiable issues, such as the fact that African-American women are more predisposed to having a stroke if they're, ex if they're affected by racism, things that you can't really quantify in a data set? Um, well, I know I see Sue. She's ask, uh, you know, answering, uh, asking a question. She can give an answer later, um, also. But I think that that's, you know, that's precisely the area that AI can actually be really good at. Right? Is that there is pattern detection capabilities with these kinds of advanced tools that actually allow you to see patterns um, that are very, very hard using, you know, sort of traditional, um, uh, you know, sort of mechanisms and means to be able to do that. So. With more and more unstructured data being made available, I mean, ONC's information blocking rules, for example, require the availability of all electronic health information. You've got deeper notes, deeper you know, narratives, uh, more social terms of information to be able to uh, you know, sort of detect those kinds of patterns as long as you have the guardrails, right? So, I mean, on net, we think that from a health equity perspective, this can actually be a good thing, while we're right now identifying there are a lot of unintended consequences where it could be a bad thing. I think also looking at the data sets that we do have and how do we get the right data sets to look at those kind of questions. So Harry's got, um, Harry in Nashville's looking at a T for C project to really get the data set that maybe you could go look at that. Um, veterans got the million veteran help, uh, veterans plan. So getting the right data sets to be able to look and answer the questions we're looking at. Something we're working with our more rural partners um, and community works users is the Learning Health Network because many of our data sets are about the, the mega uh, universities, um, large cities, you're not getting many people from rural America. So if we can go to those um, smaller facilities, those um, uh, FHQs, FHQs? Yes, FQHCs, but, yeah, FQHCs. FQHCs thank you. Um, F FQHCs and get their data and bring it in so you can also apply whatever algorithms you want onto those data sets. Suchi, she's back. Is she allowed to ask questions? I, I think she, I, <laughs> Sushi can do whatever she wants in this world. I think we all know that. I had no idea I was signing off for so much. Uh, Engagement. Exactly. Um, the question I had is for Mickey. Um, I think historically when, uh, you know, we've sort of tried to regulate a space, very often um, bigger players can engage. They have both the chest to engage, you know, like cash to engage, but also because they're big, they're often the go-to people to figure out what makes sense, and then naturally the incentives, right? Like, they're likely to give ideas that work from their point of view. Um, I think in AI, it's so important that um, I think a lot of the eco ecosystem innovation is gonna come from the very vast community of like smaller companies and startups that will hopefully be big companies at some point. What do you, what's a way in which they can be engaged more and of course I'm here, but I'm sort of more broadly speaking for it's just, I think that is sort of an area that I think would be concerning if there wasn't a vehicle for engaging them in a very deep, deep way. Yeah, um, so I, I mean, I think there's, you know, we've already got a variety of ways, you know, through our, you know, advisory recruiting process, which we try to make sure actually has, rep has good representation and isn't just the best players, but you know, it's always hard because the smaller players don't have the time or the resources to be able to invest in that. But I would just say that you know, through the, um, the different collaborative organizations who we work with, through our advisory committee, and we are always open to talking to organizations as well. I mean, uh, you know, Mickey Dotropathy at hhs.gov. Um, we, you know, absolutely have a team who are. Say that's you know, who slower. Want to talk. Say that's slower. <laughs> Mickey Dotropathy at hhs.gov. Um, and, uh, and, you, and on that a little bit, you, you mentioned earlier talking about wanting to make sure the patient voices are included and probably community voices. How, how do, I mean, that sounds good, but how does that actually happen? What needs, 
I would suspect this is a moment where leadership is required to insist that those voices are at the table. Otherwise, it's going to be impossible. Yeah, and we do that in our advisory committee. Um, we try to engage as much as possible with you know with the with the patient community. Um, as I was saying before, in working with Chai, for example, just as one example, um, one of the things that I think you know that, that Troy and I have sort of impressed upon them is the need for them to be able to have patient representation representation in um, in those as well. It's not dissimilar from the challenge that Sushi was describing with small developers that you know individuals don't have time um, you know to uh, uh, to participate in these as well. So fortunately, we've got you know great patient representatives like Grace and others um, you know who can speak on behalf of patients. But you know, but we never get enough. I mean, I think that's. You you know, certainly fair. Well, and, and so and so we've got we've got people in the room. They're going to go back to their communities. Um, w any suggestions or advice for them to talk to people uh, to try to encourage and recruit some of these voices? What what could people yeah. in this room do when they go home to bring these voices more to the forefront? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have a specific um, example. I'm not, probably not an expert in it, but there are certainly patient advocates out there and patient advocacy organizations um, that provide input, provide feedback, and provide education. Um, all of our high tech meetings are open to the public, and they are open for public comment. Um, that's a way, at least, of being registered um, as a way of you know doing that. And I, I know it's hard, but just tracking what's going on and reaching out to the patient advocacy organizations that are spend their time day to day understanding this stuff is you know probably one of the best ways to do it and i dare say that everyone in this room is a patient in some way themselves so don't forget to bring that to the table when you're having conversations thank you james hi um chris chen i'm a medical director for medicaid from washington state um thanks so much for their presentation today my, my question is a little bit of a follow-on to the first question as well as um detroit's point before about um, kind of ensuring that um, we're asking the right question in the first place about what problem are we trying to solve. And um, we don't have a great track record of equity in this country, especially as it pertains to healthcare. Um, and I think I'm concerned that if we don't um, think really intentionally about the application of the technology, that will actually continue to widen disparities and we'll, industry will be focused on disproportionately solving the problems of wealthy people rather than poor people. Um, so I guess my, my question is, is there anyone, um, is, is there a role um, in HHS, is anyone thinking about not just the innate performance of algorithms and racial bias of algorithms, but more about the application of technology? Yeah, I know. Um, so, I mean, I think the answer is it's kind of imbued in almost everything that we're trying to do. Um, I'm not, you know, really sure exactly if you know, give me more specific about what you're thinking about. I mean, from our perspective, the reason we got involved in this, um, which may not have seemed natural to people, was that we were, you know, sort of observing the increasing embedding of these kinds of technologies in electronic health record systems, and um, the electronic health record systems were being more and more used as the source of data to feed machine learning algorithms, for example. But equally important, they are the place where AI works behind the scenes in user interfaces and workflows, um, as you know, Troy was talking about workflows, to affect day-to-day -day decision making that directly affects patient lives. This isn't like a general concept of risk. This is people actually making decisions every single day about scheduling, about diagnoses, about you know, treatment decisions. So from our perspective, that's why we thought it was vitally important that we actually incorporate this in EHR certification in some way. Um, so I think that's just you know, one example. I think we're going to be looking across the table. One of the deliverables, for example, as a part of the executive order task force that I was talking about before, is in April developing a strategy as it relates to AI uses in human services side of the house. Um, so in government benefits determination and government benefits programs, for example, that are administered by the secretary, it'll be the same set of things. How do we think about trustworthiness in the applications of those as it relates to matching patients with services and inclusion and um, uh, exclusion from different programs, for example? I think, you know, so we are thinking really hard about that across the board as a part of this process. Uh, yeah. I th oh, yep. Go ahead, go for it. Hi, uh, Sean Granis. I'm uh, Vice President for Data and Analytics at the Regan Streif Institute, a professor of informatics at the Indi Indiana University and the CMIO for the Indiana Health Information Exchange. I have a two-part question regarding scoping. Um, and the first question I would ask is, so many of us for over two decades have been using artificial, what's now called artificial intelligence al algorithms in healthcare. And they're using them in spaces that I haven't heard discussed. So 
Mickey, you're going to be surprised, but I'm going to ask patient matching algorithms. I tried to get to it first. Patient matching. <laughs> <laughs> patient matching algorithms that leverage AI, um, where do they fall into the space that we've been discussing? Yeah. Um, and, and real quick, because we, we are at time. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think it's on page 483 of the regulation, um, but we actually give a very specific example um, in there where we talk about patient al matching algorithms where in general, um, they wouldn't fall in the definition of PDSI to the extent that they are um, looking at similar similarities or similarness, um, you know, patient to patient. Um, we try to be more precise in the definition of PDSI, which is that it is informing decision making, that it is deriving relationships from training data, and that it is making predictions or outcomes, which is a little bit different than, you know, uh, seeing how similar are two different individuals. Sure. So again, okay. you know, there are some cases I'm sure where you're using algorithms that might fall into that definition, but we try, as I was saying before, give examples, specific examples that can help provide a little clarity of that, and that's one of the ones that is an example in the regulation. Sure. I, I know we're at time, I'm, but I want to get the second half of my question in, and that is many algorithms that run in healthcare are parameterized, the values set in the model are set by AI. The model itself is not AI, it's more of a deterministic thing. So how have you addressed that where in the back office we're parameterizing and then what we're actually running is over here deterministic? How have you thought about that in this model? Yeah, I, I, you know, every one of these is gonna be based on the facts, but you know, I would just go back to um, you know, sort of that three-part test that I was talking about. Um, is it informing decision-making? Is it making relationships um, from training data? And then, you know, is it actually making predictions or categorizations based on that and making inferences? So if it you know, kind of falls in the, you know, meets that three-part test, then it would fall into that category. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Let's give it up for James and, and Mickey here.